it's Jessica and welcome back to Chess of the Blade. So we're gonna continue where we left off and now we have discovered that Franz is actually a royal heir to the royal family of Peruvia. So I think that's pretty cool and I didn't expect that. I really thought he was like some assassin or something like that. But regardless of that, we are gonna face with Rivian's mysterious note that he received and hopefully no one will die because I prefer that didn't happen. After making sure the door is locked, I head over to the bed and lower myself down to sit on the edge, fishing out the piece of paper from my pocket. I hesitate for a moment, but finally unfold to scan over the contents once more, swelling the foreboding feeling in my throat. Meet me tonight alone. I have a warning for you. Despite how clearly dangerous this is, I can't shake the feeling that it's something more than a trap. If someone really had wanted me dead, surely they could have slipped poison into my tea this morning, since apparently I didn't notice them sneaking up behind me. More importantly, meeting this person seems like the only way I could get any answers, or at least a clue as to what's going on. Maybe I can ask Silas to wait nearby or something just for safety's sake? I mean, I feel like, yeah, we can ask Silas, but do you think he can fight? <laughs> I'd ask Franz, except... Well, his familiar manner pushed down my guard more than it should have. I think I've been trusting him too much. Besides, there's probably some truth to what my crone of an aunt was saying. He may be planning to betray me when it's most convenient. Stupid games. With a yawn, I fall back on my bed, stretching my arms out as I sink into the fluffy duvet. The early evening sun lazily gleams through the window with just a bright enough to make me feel comfortably warm. My eyes flutter close, and in the blackness that follows, images from today and last night replay themselves. Blemish my father's name. Huh. I'll find this culprit and show just of uh, Laura and father that I can live in this cutthroat world as well as they can. And then I'll take a nice long nap. So chilly. Ugh. Where's the blanket? My eyes are still closed. I fumble around for the covers hastily. Oh god, please tell me no one's in the room. Wait a moment. I'm not under any blankets. Where are my damn blankets? I abruptly force myself upright, glancing around in confusion. Outside my window, is the, sk the sky is dark. Bloody hell, I must have fallen asleep after I came back from the festival. Shit, shit, shit! Pushing off the bed, I hastily smooth my clothes and hair, shaking my head to clear the residual drowsiness. I hope I'm not late for the meeting. To be fair, they did say tonight, without indication of time, so they better be still be there. God bless my narcoleptic soul. Oh, it's dark. Great. After making sure I, t I look at least most presentable, I slip out of the corridor, closing my door behind me with, with a soft click. It's almost eerily quiet, leading me to believe that every... To believe most everyone has already retired to their rooms. I've been so used to hearing the corridors filled with chatter streaming in with the main hall and the silence makes me a little uneasy. My footsteps echo back to me into an ominous rhythm and I start to unthinkably hold my breath as I walk along. Someone's up late. Um, Is that Celeste? Adding to the midnight meeting with your secret lover. The voice of a girl passing by makes me nearly jump out of my skin. I can't even see where she is in the thick darkness, but the voice doesn't resemble anyone I know. She seems to be chewing on something, though it smells like one of those delicious cakes I had at the festival earlier. Are you going to play with some mysterious man? You should be careful. Everyone has so many hidden secrets. Uh, yes, well, have a pleasant evening! With a flustered bow and an unseen maiden, I turn and sprint in the opposite direction, cleansing my clenching my teeth together. Um, probably just some drug noble girl returning to her room, but being reminded of secrets makes my, my mood immediately darken. She's not wrong. Franz is probably keeping more secrets from me than I can count. Really? I, I'm surprised that Celeste didn't introduce herself in this route. That's kind of weird. Before long, I arrive at the grand staircase leading into the main hall. This place... Two. This place, too, is completely silent and pervaded of a thick darkness, to the point where it's practically unrecognizable from the glowing beauty during the day. I know it's silly to put on edge by a different atmosphere, but I'm ruffled enough from this whole walk into a potential trap business that I think I'm allowed to be a bit of a scary cat. Any ghosts listening? Speak now or forever hold your peace! <laughs> Goosebumps break out on my skin as I descend the staircase and trot towards the side corridor. Emily told me about earlier, glancing over my shoulder now, and there were uh, at the various noises of night. Let's just hope no one follows me down here. I'm not sure what would be worse, being shanked in the back or being called out for acting like a boy without his teddy bear. 
Inside the dark hall, I wind my way past the various rooms, all of them clearly more functional and less orient than the guest chambers upstairs. I peek into a number of them to try to spot a portrait that I mentioned in the note, but I can't find it. I huff to myself and anxiously comb through more and more of the seemingly endless rooms, losing my way for a good few minutes. A good sense of direction never was one of my strong suits. Couldn't they have just at least drawn me a map in the back of this damn note? Please tell me we're not gonna die! This is so weird! <sighs> this is the place. At last, while walking past an open door, I notice that large and eye-catching painting inside the room. The, pomp the, the pompous crown certainly gives it away, so this must be the one. Holding my breath, I tentatively step into the chamber, my eyes darting around to catch any trace of movement. It seems surprisingly empty, however, save for the plethora of crates and boxes. Hello? Anyone else here at late night rendezvous? When no one immediately comes, my heart falls in my chest. Am I too late? Did I miss my chance to finally glean some information? <sighs> nope, you're here. What? I unconsciously yelp and jump around to face the source of the voice, which stems from a shadowy corner. My gaze falls on the slender girl sitting on the ground, who pushed herself up on her feet as she watches me with a frown. Celeste? You wrote this note? Of course I did. Next time, though, could you not make me wait further, please? I fell asleep on the cold floor, you know. What the hell? Weren't you just upstairs? Why didn't you just- Okay, you know I don't know. As if her comment was expected to inspire some deep sympathy or guilt inside me, Celeste pouts, shivering the theoretically. Well, bring a blanket next time, then. And be more specific about your cryptic notes. Can't help but feel a little disappointed and annoyed. This girl. Surely she can't have any real information on what's going on. We only met briefly, and she seemed to be a bit, well, an airhead. Well, that's not very nice to assume, Rivian. How horrible you are. And here I was, trying to help you. I only met you once, but you made my heart flatter enough that I wanted to warn you. Warn me? Warn me about what exactly? The upcoming fashion trends or the latest hairstyle, perhaps? Celeste sighs heavily, shaking her head. Then, after hesitating a moment, she steps a little closer, motioning me to lean down. I reluctantly comply, tilting my head and let her quietly speak into my ear. I didn't tell you this before, but my father's an ambassador, you know. Mm -hmm. He knows lots about what's happening, especially because he's good friends with your inquisitor. I blink, my nose wrinkling a little at the mention of Linnaeus. More importantly, though, does that mean Celeste is aware of what happened yesterday? My father survived several sabotage attempts from a cult called the Disciples of Ignatius. And he thinks they killed the Peruvian ambassador to stop the alliance talks going on. Alliance talks? Don't tell me there's been some sort of secret meeting going on behind all of this. Of course. Papa said the party was a ruse. Of to course. get ambassadors and nobles from a few countries together to feel out a partnership. Through now, obviously. Matt is do tend to do that. Now that I think about it, what Celeste says makes sense. It's not a coincidence, then, that the people with important positions like Linnaeus and Valora are here. Speaking of Valora, she must have known all about the talks, not to mention the purpose of the whole party. I wonder what her role in this is. I'm still confused as to how you're involved, though. Did you just eavesdrop your- Did you just eavesdrop your father's business all day? Celeste gives me a hurt look for a moment, but then an expression turns a little serious. Actually, I saw the murderers last night. Oh... What? Really? I didn't expect that. I really didn't think she was there. I stared at her intently, trying to see if she played around or obviously lying, but the girl seems completely honest. I was walking out for a bit of fresh air after dinner, and suddenly I spotted two figures crouching in the bushes. I couldn't make out who they were, only that one was big and wearing something unusually bulky, and the other was much smaller. They didn't notice me, thankfully, because they were talking to each other. I saw you two walking on the other side of the bushes. Didn't you hear them at all? He heard whispering. I can feel the blood draining from my face as a little as Celeste recounts her story. Those people whispering. I did hear them right before I encountered Arden, didn't I? But how do you know that they were murderers? Some shady whispers didn't mean they were criminals. Well, when I started suspecting that something was happening, I hid in the bushes myself. That was when the ambassador came outside. He must have been tricked by one of them because he was completely alone. Oh. He had a deep end to the gardens, past where you'd been standing. And when I looked back to the figures, they had disappeared. I had a bad feeling about it. So I went to tell one of the guards. And sure enough, they found the ambassador dead soon after. 
An unsettling expression comes across Celeste's face as she lowers her gaze. Although something about her personality tells me she's probably familiar with such grisly things, considering her father's important position. The murderers didn't see you then. Do you think you're safe? I'm quite sure I am, but I know they noticed you, Rivian. I stopped whispering when you came close. Shit! I watched you after your cute friend walked up. It's a good thing he found you, honestly. So they know, yeah, so th th our speculation was right, as uh, Linnaeus and all of them, even Franz, they know that we saw them. Either way, I think they suspect you saw them, or at least know about them. And one of the new friends I met here told me he accidentally involved you in things last night. I swallowed, feeling my small beads of perspiration pearl along my hairline. Franz guess, Franz's guess may have been right. Perhaps they're looking for me after all. Your new friend, eh? Are you talking about the bratty, stammering boy, Alistair? Don't talk about him like that. Yeah, that's a he's bit rude. A dang, little thing. <laughs> Although, he's keeping some kind of secret, I think. He called all members when I asked him some questions. This time it's something about protecting someone. What? Didn't he say that to us? But he said her, and I assumed it was Celeste, so maybe it's not? Well, that sounds familiar. The boy definitely has more information I need, but just how- But I just have to find a way to get him out of him. Anyway, I just wanted to tell you to be careful. If the disciples are behind this, they won't want to leave behind anyone who can know their identities. You could be in real danger. That's just lovely. Well, Celeste, you had you you had best watch yourself too. You might be spotted as you might have been spotted as well, and it seems like you saw much more than I did. She lets out a little giggle, shaking her head confidently. I'm really starting to doubt whether she takes all this seriously enough. Life or death matters should not introduce giggling. I can take care of myself. <laughs> Besides, I- Get down! What? When an urgent yell suddenly cuts through the air, I instinctively grab Celeste and pull her down to the floor. What the fuck is happening? A split second later, a large crossbow bolt thunks into the wall just behind us. Oh, okay, I guess we're dying now. With my heart nearly exploding in my chest, my eyes shoot up to the doorway. There is a heavily armored figure that stands with a crossbow pointed directly at us. No. I can't be a guard? Uh. What? The guard grunts in disgust and throws the crossbow to one side, pulling out the blade with uh, from a scabbard at his side instead. His focus, however, doesn't seem to be on us anymore. Instead, he turns to the side, suddenly raising his sword defensively. A, a loud clang responds through the air and the guard staggers back in the room. The figure who's followed after him with long strides is... Hey, it's Franz! He came to save us! Franz? Yeah, before I can even stop myself, I call out Franz's name anxiously. He approaches the guard with aggressive stance and piercing focus enough to look into his eyes. In one hand, Franz holds a long, elegant sword. With the other, grips a dagger. The two blades point an edge, gleaming in the lethal- Oh shit, he's using two blades! With lethal sharpness. Celeste backs into a corner, staring at Franz with wide eyes. She looks like she recognizes him. Well, she would, wouldn't she? Silas said Franz was watching her at the party. Ugh. This is no time to think about that! Ah! The guard, who is just as tall as Franz, and maybe a little more broader, brings his sword down in a savage cut. But Franz darts back, moving surprisingly quick. Then, as the guard co recovers, Franz dashes back in, swiping at the man's exposed neck. Yikes! Barely managing to block it in time, the guard uses his bulky strength to savagely cut forward, only to be parried with a fast swipe from Franz's dagger. It's clear that Franz is a quicker man, but he's got none of the guard's armor and the blade won't pierce anywhere in the but weak spots. I can dance all night, you know. Better give up while you can or we'll bore our lovely audience. <laughs> <laughs> they trade blows back and forth at increasing speed. The guard's movements resembles a field soldier, while Franz looks more like a court-trained fencer, elegant and swift. I imagine so, he is a royalty. Despite looking around for a way to help, my eyes fall upon a heavy-looking candlestick laying nearby. I grab a hold of it with both hands, hefting its sturdy weight, then focus my gaze on the guard's back. Take this, you fat metal can! <laughs> Rivian, what are you doing? With all my strength, I hurl the candlestick towards the armored man. It slams into his flank, and in an awful mix of a thud and clank, sending him staggering off balance. <sighs> Franz doesn't hesitate for a moment, dashing forward to plant his boot into the guard's knees. Sure enough, the attacker goes tumbling on the floor, landing his head first against the heavy crate. Ugh, that's gotta hurt a little. I can't help but wince at the guard's head lolled to one side, the fall likely knocking him out completely unconscious. Mm. 
After sheening his two blades and the scabbards attached to his belt, Franz lowers onto one knee in front of the man's limp form, yanking his helmet off. Who is it? The guard reveals to be a resemble of a mercenary more than anything. Oh, okay, so it's not really a guard, it's just some guy. With a savage scar across one eye and a broken looking nose, and lips permanently curled into a, a, cur a cruel expression. Why did a god attack us? Are we wanted criminals? Celeste's trembling voice from where she stands hurling in the corner, biting her lip nervously. I'm a little shaken up too, although an unusual sense of exhilaration permeates me as much as anything else. I'd wager that this is no god. Yeah. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing, using the armor to try and hide his identity. I'm sure Glasses will love <laughs> to have a little chat with him in the dungeons. I almost feel sorry for this poor fool. I studied the guard shape curiously, my mind fi filtering the words Celeste was telling me a minute ago. Celeste, could this be man one of the figures you saw last night in the bushes? <gasps> she blinks at my words, curiously examining the unconscious man while stepping closer. I, I think he's the same one. I if he was wearing that armor, then that explains why he looks so bulky. Oh, probably because he had his helmet off while talking to that guy, right? But he she couldn't really see because it's dark, so that probably is the guy. It seems he wanted to get rid of both of you at once. I bet he was afraid you were getting close to figuring things out. So then he knew Celeste was there too! I breathe a silent sigh of relief at knowing our attacker will safely lock up for now, yet the sense of uneasiness continues to tingle down my spine. But Celeste saw two people together last night. There must be still another murderer out there, one clever enough not to get too easily caught, like this bastard. A grim silence follows my words, along with the foreboding cloud that weighs heavily in the air. Rather than feeling safe, I can't help but dread the idea of the second murderer is going to target us even more, now that we captured their co-conspirator. After a few long tense moments, Franz finally pulls himself back up to his feet, grabbing the guard beneath his arms. Let's go leave this unpleasant fellow in Sir Four Eyes' <laughs> tender care, shall we? Hold on a moment. I want to know why you're spying on Ravine and me first. Celeste, who appears to have regathered, regathered her composure somewhat, trains an accusing glare on Franz. I'm curious too, he's my bodyguard. Um, okay, like I said in Arden's Root, it's not that like I think Celeste is like a bad guy, but I can't trust her because we don't really freaking know anything about her. She gave us information, but she seems too shady to me for for me to trust her, so I feel like I should protect Franz rather than, you know, asking. He, he's my bodyguard. Clearing my throat, I offer Celeste a reassuring grin. Actually, Franz here is my unofficial bodyguard. With all the unpleasant murder business going on, I thought it'd be at least best to have someone at my side. Mm. <laughs> he's like, what? Franz looks at me a little surprised by my response, shooting me a curious look. It doesn't take long, though, for his eyes to light up warmly. He nods in agreement, bowing a little to emphasize my statement. It's as he says, my lady. I have to keep a close watch on him at all times so that he doesn't accidentally get his pretty head lopped off. Thanks! Hmm. That may be true, but... Still, you look awfully familiar. I could have sworn I'd seen you somewhere else before. Oh! Oh, I thought she knew who he was. Never mind. As Celeste studies Franz suspiciously, I realize she doesn't fully recognize his identity. But if she's an ambassador's daughter, and he's a part of the Peruvian royal family, they probably encountered each other before at some diplomatic event. I think you may be mistaken, miss. I'm merely a common chivalrous rogue, dedicated to rescuing such damsels in distress as you two. Oh, thanks! Franz ignores my burning glare at just as... Uh, and just grins wolfishly instead. Although she still looks doubtful, Celeste huffs a little and shrugs her shoulders, adjusting her hair with one hand. Well, I'll let you two deal with him. Papa's probably worried sick about me, so I'd better get back to our family suite. Okay. She pauses, glancing over towards me with her lips pursed slightly in concern. Be careful, Rivian. I'm going to lay low until after the party's over, and you should probably do the same. And make sure not to trust just anyone. Okay, Celeste shoots a look over to Franz, a delicate frown on her pale features, before she shakes her head and hurries towards the door. She disappears around the corner within a few seconds, her lightly pa uh, pattering footsteps fade into silence. Franz and I are left alone in the storage room, well, save for the unconscious man snoring in Franz's grip. 
Well, let's get back to the hall, shall we? Best get our sleeping beauty here, safely locked away before he wakes up after all. You're right. Grab his other arm. We'll make quicker progress with the two of us hauling him along. Unless you'd rather just walk ahead of me and provide a nice view, of course. Oh my god, Franz! <laughs> Can't look at Rev's butt yet. I dare you hold the so-called guard's arm, and together with Franz, we drag his body into the hallway. He's heavy enough to, uh, that I doubt I could lift him myself, but Franz seems completely unstrained. Because he's fit as fuck! We, we bring him into the main hall where Franz finds the nearest actual guard patrolling outside the window, calling him inside to ex uh, explaining him what happened. The guard, who seems a little shaken and embarrassed, confirms that the man is an imposter. He agrees to take the man to the holding cells and call Linnaeus to question him, apologizing profusely for not recognizing something funny about his false compatriot sooner. With our murderous cargo safely delivered, Franz and I leave the guard's company and head upstairs, a slightly uncomfortable silence hanging between us as we return to the upper halls. A burning question weighs on my mind while we walk, so I decided to bring it up rather bluntly. I heard that you were showing a lot of interest in Celeste during the celebration. You know her? Trying to sound casual as possible, I glance in Franz's direction. He shoots a quick look towards me, his eyes widening brief in surprise before his brow furrows slightly. I know who her father is. I'm not fond of him. I suspected she'd be involved in whatever unpleasant business. That's why was he was eyeing at her too much. I thought she'd be a participant rather than a target. I still don't trust her, but I doubt she'll pose much of a problem. Besides, I think she likes you too much to want you killed. <laughs> Are you jealous? <laughs> Is it my imagination, or does Franz sound a little annoyed? Did both of us get an impression that the other had taken liking to Celeste? Well, no matter. I feel a little relieved knowing the truth, even though I shouldn't care about it one way or another. With Franz still walking at my side, I head to the direction of my room, expecting him to break off at some point to say he's going to his own chambers. And then I remember that our rooms are right next to each other. Ugh. I'm starting to wonder if he really didn't plan this all along somehow. We reach our respective doors along, uh, before long, and I move towards mine, clearing my throat poignantly. Well, I should thank you again for for what you did tonight. I wish you'd be a little less sneaky about following me, though. Franz stops next to me, st staring down, uh, gazing down into my eyes with an intense glimmer of his own emerald orbs. You'd rather me follow you openly, then? <laughs> Shall I attach myself to you and keep you trapped forever in my life? What the hell does that mean? No, I really wasn't implying. Ugh. What happened? The larger male suddenly steps closer pulling me into his arms and pressing up against until our chests are flushed together. His heavy weight pins me- pins my- oh my god, pins my back to the wall! It makes it so that I can do little but squirm, futile in his grip, feeling much like a mouse caught in a cat's paw. Jesus Christ! Oh! Wow! Oh, whoa! We're already doing this, huh? Uh... <laughs> this is the third time, I swear! I'm going to report you to the guards for harassment! I growl in annoyance, but the fear and anger filled me during our first meeting is difficult to muster this time around. One of Franz's arms curled itself around my waist, while the fingers pressed behind my head run through my hair, grabbing a rough handful. But it's so hard to keep my hands off you, kitten. Your innocence and fire are like a drug I just can't get enough of. Uh, Jesus, okay, we get it, you're horny for Riv, but oh my god! He presses closer, leaning towards my neck. The hand in my hair pulls my head back slightly, exposing my throat, where Franz presses his lip to my skin hotly, letting out a warm exhale that rolls off my flesh. The sensation causes, me, causes a sweet shiver down the course of my spine, and my breath catches. Oh god, that means Riven likes it! <laughs> he traces a warm, wet line of kisses along the curve of my neck, all the way up to my ear. Catching the lobe of my in his teeth, he nibs softly before dragging his tongue along the tender skin, nuzzling me- nuzzling against me. It wasn't my intention to treat you like this. Not at first. But after we met on the balcony, something about your spite, your stubbornness, sent me tumbling into an <laughs> Basically what he's saying, he's into soon today. <laughs> you just keep refusing to be caught, and I adore it. Each time you slip away will make it so much sweeter when I finally capture you and make you mine. His low purr rumbles promisingly in my ear, and my heart st starts to pound harder with each word. He sounds so earnest, so longing, but surely those words are empty. Isn't he telling me what he thinks I want to hear? 
He's, he still thinks he's like a playboy. He won't like commit to Rivian and whatever. And why exactly do you believe you'll be able to make me yours? I'm not the sort to play around, Franz. My voice comes out soft and slightly uncertain. I can only pray that the gods that no one decides to walk down the hallway at this moment or listen from behind their door. I think I'd die of shame. Franz presses his lips almost ravishly onto one of my flushed cheeks, bringing our mouths steadily closer together. Oh, I don't intend to play around, kitten. I plan on keeping you all to myself. And you're a jealous little thing, aren't you? I'll nurture that until you're as possessive of me as I am of you. Oh my god, okay. <laughs> How does he know I'm jealous? It's not my fault I'm unused to being... Un unused? Okay. It's not my fault that I'm used to being toyed with. He's playing so unfairly! Sounds like a healthy relationship. Are you going to put a collar on me too? Mm, you're already wanting to be my... <laughs> That can be a <laughs> Oh my god! I had no idea you were into such naughty things. Oh! Woo! Okay, you know, I'm okay with this because Vervian wants it, so it's totally fine, but jeez! Wow, check out that CG. Damn! I like it. Good. Okay, I'm alright. Before I get so much mutter out of retort, Franz uses his grip on my hair abruptly presses my head forward. Smashing our lips together in a hungry kiss, hard enough to almost hurt, the climax of passion building up that makes me tremble a little in his arms. The resistance leave me and I press back against Franz a little bit, parting my lips and letting his tongue press into my mouth and dance with my own. His head- his heady- his heady or heady? His heady taste and scent, one of the mingled sweet, sweetness and spice, floods my senses and makes me feel a little dazed. He presses his thighs between my- oh, okay. Presses- wow! <laughs> he presses his thigh between my leg, entwining us together as he greedily cleaves my lips with, with a long, wet kiss is hot enough to make my whole body feel practically on fire. Oh god. A delicious euphoria courses down my spine, into my head, and embarrassingly heated sound leaves my mouth when Franz breaks off the kiss, burying his face against my neck, biting the soft flesh. You guys should go into your room. I am just saying, what if someone walks out and sees them like... <laughs> I know full well that it'll leave a bruise, but I can hardly say that it's a forefront of my mind. Uh, he lavishes my jaw, cheek, and lip with several more kisses, leaving the white mark on my skin be before finally pulling away a little bit, voice lowered in a silky growl. I'm taking you tomorrow night to the masquerade ball. You're going to feel like a princess by the time the night's over. And I plan to dance with you more than just in the ball. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> Franz offers me a warm, predatory smirk. His eyes gazing into mine as if the only thing, if I'm the, as if I'm the only thing of any co consequence in his world at the moment. You're awful. Our princess doesn't go rolling around the sheets with her bodyguard. You'll have to try harder. He chuckles softly, his fingers releasing their grip in my on my hair and tracing down the back of my neck slowly and longingly. At last, he gradually loosens his embrace and steps back, still watching me with an intense and unwavering look on his face. Just you wait. I'll have you begging for me at the end of a few dances. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we're gonna go dancing with Franz later! <laughs> Franz reaches out towards the door uh, to his room, casting a lingering glance back towards me. I'll see you in the morning. Make sure you dream of me, although my balcony door's unlocked. Should you wake up in the middle of the night, wanting the real- <laughs> Alright, thanks! <laughs> Don't flatter yourself! Oh, come on, Ruby, you were just making out with him! <laughs> I shake my head at him, huffing before unlocking my own door and quickly pushing inside before he changes his mind and attacks me again. Slamming the door shut behind me, I let out a long, heavy exhale, resisting the urge to give in to my shaky legs and slop down onto the floor. I can't believe that just happened. Or more precisely, I can't believe I let it happen so easily. There have been only a few people that I felt anything for the past, but I didn't think it was possible to get swept up by someone so quickly. The more I learn about Franz, the more mysterious he becomes. I still don't know how he's familiar with my father, or why he visited me on that first night and was so intent in protecting me. But I can't deny the warmth that I feel from being in his arms, and rush of excitement of his attention. However scandalous they may be, give me. To think I've gone from a self-respecting young man to a gushing like to gushing like a dazzled maiden in the span of a few days. Well, I can say that I'm quite glad that my parents didn't accompany me to this affair. <laughs> After I catch my breath and recover my senses of composure, I undress and slip into the bed, this time properly diving under the covers. 
There can't be any more hours left until morning, but I might as well catch a bit of rest of, of sleep before tomorrow. I'll probably need it, since there's, a, since there's still work to be done. I'm not out of the woods yet. The second the murderer is still on loose. As my eyes close, I feel the lingering warmth from Franz's lips onto my skin, shivering slightly and shaking my head to the rid of the improper thoughts. It takes a while for a restless tossing and turning, but eventually the haze slumber settles back over me and I drift off into unconsciousness. Mmm, chocolate. Ugh, don't put it there, it tickles! A loud knocking on my door suddenly bursts into my bubble of my pleasant dreams. Startled awake, I push myself upright, blinking to rid my eyes of haziness. Outside my window, the sky is unusually dark. The soft pattering of droplets against the glass make me realize it must be storming. Uh, coming! I'm coming! One moment! I put on my clothes as fast as I can, missing a few buttons, and I rush over to the door to pull it open. Oh! Rather than the face of someone I was expecting, like Franz or Silas, the person standing before me is none other than Hazel's mom, the maid Emily. The Rivian. It's terrible. I did something awful. Please help me. What? Looking like she's about to break into tears, Emily bites her lower lip and stares at me pleadingly. Uh, uh, let's calm down, shall we? Step inside for a moment and tell me what happened. I gesture for her to enter my room a bit awkwardly, and she hurries past the door with an anxious nod. Well, what an excellent start to my morning, a hysterical maiden begging me for help. I can, I'm sure this can only pretend great things for the rest of the day. After I close the door behind us, I turn back to Emily, frowning at her desperate expression. Slow down for a moment, Emily, and take a breath. Now, what's the matter? It's, it's Lady Valora. She's been apprehended by the guards. What? Why? I blink. Surely I must have misheard her. My aunt arrested? Are you sure you're talking about Valora, the king's foreign affairs advisor? Old stuffy lady, gruesome personality? Yes, I am. I know you're related, and I was afraid to come to you because I thought you'd be angry, but I don't know who else to ask. For how pale and from how pale and visibly unsettled this woman is, she clearly has done something related to Valora's apprehension. It must be quite bad too. I'm not sure how else they I'm not sure how else they have grounds for detaining a woman of her position. Well, I'm sure everything was just a big misunderstanding, why do they arrest her? Glaring, glaring too angrily at the Inquisitor. Emily swallows hard, gripping her hem of her skirt so hard that her knuckles start to turn white. They found a weapon in her room, a knife covered with dried blood. It matches the wound on the victim from the other night, and so oh. she's been taken in and charged with murder. Wait, could this be- No, no, that doesn't sound right. I think this is a planted. That doesn't sound right. As much as the aunt, she's a crazy lady and she's kind of grumpy, but I don't think she would go far as to murdering someone. That doesn't sound right. At that, my jaw practically hits the floor. My old baddie aunt, a murderer? Impossible. And yet, why on earth was someone like that in her room? But Cerivian, I think that knife was there because of me. Huh? Whoa, 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 hold on there. Because of you. I need some details, Emily. She brushes her trembling fingers through her hair, inhaling and exhaling a deep breath in a visible attempt to calm herself. Well, two nights ago, I was cleaning the upper halls when suddenly one of the guards approached me. The fake guard? He gave me a small bundle of wrapped cloth and told me it was something Lady Valora had dropped. But as she was down in the ballroom, I ought to leave it in her room when I went to clean it. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's the fake guard gave her the thing with the weapon in it. And yeah, okay, it was planted. It's not real. I thought it was, well, a little strange, but I didn't see any reason not to trust one of the guards. So when I went to Lady Valora's chambers, I tucked the wrapped cloth inside one of her top drawers, since she is a very fastidious lady and does not like anything lying around her room. I can tell from her crescent-fallen, guilty tone of voice that she's beating herself on the inside for, using, for being used to frame Valora. It's difficult to really blame her, though. I guess who the guard she spoke of, it must have been right after the murderer. And now that I think about it, didn't the brawler from earlier say that he was- that he saw her in the hallway that night? The thing is, I couldn't shake the horrible feeling that I got from speaking with the guard. The way he gave me the bundle and very slowly, quietly, told me to put it in her room. It was almost like he was threatening me. It made me feel so nervous that my hands were shaking on my way to Lady Valora's chambers. 
But I thought that if I complained about the guard to someone in charge, I'd be punished or mocked for it. So I, I said no. Okay, it's not really your fault. It's fine. She trails off into an almost inaudible murmur, closing her eyes for a long moment, her head drooping slowly towards the ground. The poor woman looks like she's ready to start, uh, for me to start yelling at her at the top of my lungs, as if it's some sort of puppy who chewed up all the expensive furniture. Of course, Valora's life is a bit more important than furniture. Only slightly, though. <laughs> well, this is a proper mess, isn't it? Did you explain all of that to the Inquisitor, though? I'm sure he's, was I'm sure he's reasonable enough to see that it was a setup. Just when I thought Emily was already white as a ghost, uh, she seemed to somehow grow a shade paler. The thing is, sir, that wasn't all they found. There was something else. A blood-stained cloth, hidden in her personal chest, which only she has the key to. Oh. What? That's weird. I didn't put it there, and only Silas and I hold the master keys for the guest chambers. But I know it wasn't Silas. I'd sooner trust him before myself. And so... Lady Valora must have known about the cloth. Well, like, it doesn't mean it's blood from, like, the murder. Maybe she's using because... Okay, there's a thing, like, I know there's a bunch of disease when you cough up blood, and I feel like maybe she wouldn't want to tell you when she's sick. That could be a thing. It just seems a little bit weird. I don't think it's her. This is, like, a red herring thing. Confusion clouds my mind as I, as I, praise, as I praise Emily's concerned words. I still don't know how Valora could possibly be a killer of anything except my hopes and dreams, that is. So why did she have something like so incriminating? My aunt's a smart woman. Whenever she was doing that whatever she was doing with that cloth, I'm sure she knew the risk of keeping it in her room. I'm starting to think it was a very well planned setup. The key is just to find who's moving all the pieces into place. I don't mention it out loud to Emily, but it sounds very plausible that those disciples of Ignatius are behind this too. To both kill an ambassador and worsen relationship even further by framing foreign advisors for it. It's a perfect plan to force the two countries into war. I think you're right, sir. I want to see Lady Valora freed and apologize for everything. I just... I don't know what I should do. And I fear if I involve myself too much, my little Hazel may be in danger. The maid gazes at me pleadingly, as if expecting me to solve everything and save the day right there and then. You've been quite helpful, Emily. Don't be too hard on yourself. I find a way to figure this out, somehow. I believe in you, sir. The King always put such faith in your father to solve every problem that came up. And I'm sure you'll become even more famous than he was. Thanks! But I don't know if Werb wants that. I wince a little as my father is brought up, like always. Still, Emily means well, so it's difficult to get too annoyed at her. That I'm pretty sure she burst into tears if I uh, so much as gave her an angry look right now. Yes, yes. Well, that aside, I'll reach out to you. Uh, I'll reach out to you should I have any questions. In the meantime, don't go taking any parcels from strangers, eh? As you say, sir. Thank you so much, and best of luck to you. Why is it always Ruben getting dragged into this bullshit all the time? <laughs> she gives me a grateful curtsy and hurries back to the door, quietly slipping out into the hall. I'm left with a renewed, uncomfortable sense of responsibility, and I sigh quietly while rubbing the bridge of my nose. It's one thing to look out for myself, but now I have to try to get Valora off the hook too? As much as I try to put a brave face for Emily, I feel that this quickly measured up to the impossible task. As if the echo in my sentiment, a distant thunder rumbles slowly, like a growl of some, sun, of some unseen danger. Well, that's nice! My stomach growls too, reminding me that I haven't eaten since yesterday afternoon. This boy needs to eat! Like every route, this guy is not eating! <laughs> There was so much going on that I didn't even think about it. Well, I could always stand loose for a few pounds, probably. Okay, guys, I'm going to end the episode right here. So a lot has ha happened. Uh, I'm happy that, you know, Franz and, and uh, Rivian are getting along. And more specifically that there's consensual, like, interactions between them. Because now Rivian wants it. So I'm okay with it. Um, but Franz is a little bit forceful. I'm not going to lie. Um, but I don't know. I feel like the, the aunt being, like, the murderer is, like too easy because she's a crazy like old lady who doesn't like anyone so i get it but like to murder the peruvian ambassador she's not an idiot though so i feel like she's being framed it's not really like the the hidden cloth i don't think that's really uh her fault anyway you guys tell me what you think in the comments um and what you think about celeste because i i really don't think i can trust her at least in this route because like she's kind of shady 
Anyway, thanks once again to Arjun Games for sending me a Steam key to play their game. And if you guys enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like, comment, and subscribe to join the companions. And if you would like to help support the channel on Patreon, the link is in the description. You can also support the channel for free with gawkbox.com slash a girl and a game. All you have to do is make an account and open it up on mobile, download the games on my page, and play them, and you will donate real money to the channel, which will help me continue this series and continue the channel overall. Woo! I'm glad they kissed! But it's just, once again, I'm very concerned as to, like, if Rivian is gonna die, because he's the real target in this, rather than, like, another person, you know? So, we'll see what happens. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye! <laughs> Damn, this entire route should just be titled, We Need to Hug Sena. That's what it should be. <laughs> so stupid. I keep thinking... And sometimes that brings people together in a not-so-cute way. Here are six terribly awkward romances in video games. Number six, Cole and Elsa.